Um, I, I apologize. I was going to read the, <laughs> the, the, the first part of my talk out because it's the end of the conference and my brain isn't quite where it ought to be. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at a bit more myth for fulfillment. Um, archaeology has tended to approach mythology from, I believe, the wrong direction, uh, using excavated structures and other material remains from sites with legendary associations in search for some deeper truth concerning the origin of folklore. In reality, it would appear that it was the mythology that provided the inspiration for specific building projects, rather than the structural remains representing in some way the residue of genuine events which over time have become mythologized. The mythological and folkloric foundations of Britain have proved a fertile ground for those seeking political and dynastic stability, competing medieval aristocracies attempting to anchor specific legends to natural places through the deployment of monumental architecture. And it's only by studying the archaeology of myth fulfillment and examining how the legends of Britain were appropriated and made real, can we truly hope to understand the foundations and aspirations of the medieval state. So, there are, of course, lots and lots of aspects of folklore and mythology in the British Isles. Uh, we just take, for instance, the Arthurian story, which I, I guess is the, uh, is the major one. And there's always that sort of sense that there's no smoke without fire. Therefore, there's so many stories about King Arthur, there must be a post-Roman warlord upon whom all that baggage can be placed. And there he is, Clive Owen, at the bottom there, <laughs> in the fantastic film King Arthur. And there is that sense of, if we dig in the right places, we can find material evidence that supports the existence of such a character. Um, we've got uh, Rally Bradford there excavating at Glastonbury in 1962. And again, of course, there's that uh, immediate, I guess, surprise in the sense of digging on sites that have legendary associations. There are indeed significant amounts of post-Roman archaeology. And in that sense, really, what I'm sort of trying to propose, and other people have proposed similar ideas as well, is really to think more about um, less on the origins of the particular stories and more about the sense of an archaeology of legend truthing and indeed myth fulfillment and hopefully as you'll see they have significant amounts of crossover but it is important to try and understand what they are what they represent because they've had a huge impact upon the architecture of medieval Britain. So to begin with legend truthing and we'll start with um, Tintagel. Of course, Tintagel is, is one of the most spectacular sites uh, in the UK. Uh, has huge amounts of tourists going every, every year, predominantly because of the Arthurian story. Less so, perhaps, because they are a particular love of medieval architecture. But it's that link with Arthur. And it's a very difficult thing to try and play um, in the sense of not accepting that there was an Arthur, but also trying to give some kind of advice, some kind of information to people who come there for that reason. And so this is a rather older English heritage um, signboard. Um, the legendary birthplace of King Arthur, which sort of gets around it in a way, uh, apart from the fact, of course, that in the legends, that's not where Arthur was born. We, no, no one actually says where <laughs> Arthur was born. That's where he was conceived. And that perhaps is a little bit more sordid. Uh, <laughs> uh, and therefore, you don't actually put that on your signboard. But it's <laughs> the actual legend itself, uh, which is first set down by Geoffrey Monmouth in uh, the 1130s. This is where Arthur's father, uh, Uther Pendragon, who's from the House of London, um, is transformed into the body of, of Golois by Merlin, so he can spend the night with Higurna, Golois' his wife, from the House of Cornwall. We'll, we'll gloss over that, but essentially the product is Arthur is conceived. He is the product of both these two royal houses, which are significant in Geoffrey's account. And of course there is this sort of feeling that a lot of Geoffrey Monmouth's writings, he's tying specific stories to landscapes that he is aware of, landscapes and places where there is a, a mythology already existing. And excavations at Tintagel, of course, have shown that, yes, there's a, a significant amount of post-Roman archaeology of the right time that fits the folkloric mythological Arthur. So we've got a, a trade hub. We've got evidence of Mediterranean goods coming in and British goods going out. And we don't know who's controlling that particular trade, but there's significant amounts of activity there. And 
we've got that sort of sense also, sort of, I guess, building on from the signboards, the idea of, of creating things that don't necessarily signpost an Arthur, <coughs> but give the visitors something more to think about. We've got the sort of uh, enigmatic hooded figure statue, uh, got <coughs> many sort of selfies of people going up to Tintagel today. We've got the face of Merlin carved onto the, the wall. There's a sort of <coughs> more sort of art being generated there, which Strangely, in the press and with a lot of sort of local views, uh, people have, some people have complained about the, the so-called Disneyfication of Tintagel, of adding fantastical fictional elements to the site, which always makes me smile because I think, have you actually seen Tintagel? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love the I, I love the place. It's an absolutely amazing place. But it is today the whole industry is Arthur. You can't escape Arthur, Merlin, Lancelot, Guinevere. They're everywhere. Bookshops, cafes. Um, event places, you know, souvenirs is there. The Disneyfication is already there. But arguably, it also began in the 13th century. We've got Richard, first Earl of Cornwall, who creates much of the buildings that we can see at Tintagel today. Second son of King John, brother to King Henry III. And it's Richard who establishes a significant masonry residence on Tintagel. It's, this is not a state of the art fortification, it's not a battle castle, this is a frankly rather bizarre place to build a house on this rather exposed headland, but of course it's important because of the mythological associations. Geoffrey of Monmouth has already credited Arthur being conceived there, but as Mark Bowden uh, from Historic England has already sort of shown uh, and others sort of surveying that particular site, there are deeper myths embedded in the archaeology of Tintagel. I mean, to begin with, this, the house that he's built there is built in a mock antiquated style. It's not a 13th century structure. It's harking back to sort of earlier eras. But it's also harking back, as, as Mark's shown and others have indicated, the idea of Tristan and Isolde, or Tristan and Isolde in more sort of anglicised um, versions, which is a much deeper myth, much earlier myth than King Arthur. It also forms the basis of the Arthur uh, Lancelot Guinevere love triangle that, that appears in later versions of Arthur's life. But, to cut a long story short, we've got King Mark of Cornwall, who in some versions of the story is sending his son, Tristan, in other cases it's his nephew, in some other versions it's just his champion, to Ireland to bring Isolde back to marry as a sort of a marriage partnership. On the way back, the two fall in love. And I'm sort of pre like paintings, it's coming around and go, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the realisation of what has happened. And of course, in the version of the, most of the stories we get, there, there are three key landscape elements um, in King Mark's court. We've got the walled garden where Tristan and Isolde conduct their illicit relationship. We've got a chapel where Tristan seeks sanctuary in, which is surrounded by the troops of King Mark. He manages to make a, a daring escape down the side of a cliff and rescues or kidnaps is all the two of them hide in the subterranean passage whilst the soldiers of King Mark search fruitlessly for them. And of course, those are the three key elements that we see on the main headland at Tintagel. The bit you're exploring around there, they, they don't seem to make a lot of sense from a functional point of view because they're not meant to be functional. This is the earliest example of Disneyfication, to use that sort of term, or creating a, a very private theme park. Um, this is Earl Richard's sort of legend truth thing of the King Mark, uh, the Tristan and Isolde story. But those three key, key features there, it's creating a reality from the myths. We can go to Dinas Emrys in uh, Gwynedd. We've got this great Iron Age hill fort, this massive sort of rocky outcrop, just to the southern edge of Snowdonia. It's a site where, mythologically speaking, we've got the story of Vortigern and Merlin, Merlin Ambrosius, uh, which features both in Nennius and Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth gives a more sort of detailed account. But in a, in a sense there, you've got bad King Vortigern, who's brought the Saxons into Britain, who is escaping from them. He's trying to build a citadel in uh, Snowdonia. Overnight, um, the, the, the building work collapses, all the tools are disappearing. There's something wrong about this site, which means that it can't be built upon. And they go down into a sort of local vicinity. They get this young lad, Merlin, um, because he's supposed to have been born without a father. 
They're going to sacrifice him, sprinkle his blood on the site, and therefore exercise whatever's there. And it's Merlin who comes up with the idea of, no, obviously, the water. <laughs> <laughs> want, if you excavate in a specific area, you'll find a subterranean pool. They do that, and what they find is a serpent, or dragons in some versions of the story, a white one and a red one in continual combat. The white one pushes the red one into a corner and looks like it's about to strike the death blow when finally the red one overcomes the white one. And Merlin, in, and again, different versions of the story, credits this. The white serpent, the white dragon, is the Saxons. The red one is effectively the Britons. The Saxons look like they're going to win the battle to begin with, but in the end, the red is triumphant and the Britons will reclaim their homeland. So it's an important folkloric mythological site and arguably one of the... Um, causes one of the um, sort of beginnings of the Welsh flag. And if you go to Dinas Emrys today and you climb this rather suicidally steep hill, you will see that there is indeed a rather sort of square, rectangular, um, looks like a reservoir. It's being claimed to be a reservoir, a pool. It, it's, it's medieval, no real sort of clear idea of what it could be. There's other strange sort of structural features around there. And it's uncomfortably true, or is it an uncomfortable feeling for most archaeologists to feel, well, this is the site with that mythological basis of the subterranean pool with the dragons. There is indeed a pool. There is indeed a sort of a, a, a contained space. It's the wrong date, but it's the right date for Llewellyn the Great, who is, we know, is in control of this particular area. And I suspect it is he who is creating who is legend truthing that particular site, who is creating the physical remains to actually ground that legend and to prove it real. It's a great nationalistic, it's a great sort of uh, emotive place to be in control of, especially because that's where the myth of the red and white dragons comes from. We can explore the archaeology of myth fulfilment and, and take another good Welsh example at Carnarvon Castle, uh, very close on the Menai Strait. We've got a fortress built by Edward I. Uh, it was played by Patrick McGowan, the only good part of the film uh, Braveheart. Uh, but we've got there sort of the, the <coughs> conquest of North Wales, the establishment of a series of, of military bases and protected towns. And as many people have sort of noted, it's you know the, the, the site of Carnarvon is resident with sort of a whole series of myths. The most potent of which is the myth of Maxon Ledig, the, the, the dream of Maxon that appears in the Mabinogion. And in that version of the story, Maxon is a Roman emperor who has dreams of a faraway distant land, a fairy tale castle, um, a sort of a, a extremely attractive young woman. And he sends people out to try and find where this person is, to find out where, where she is, where her family is, where her castle is. And it comes back with, it's in North Wales, it's in Snowdonia. He travels there, he stays at the court, uh, he falls madly in love with her. But whilst he's there, his kingdom is taken by an usurper. And he has to bring an army back from Britain, <coughs> gathering reinforcements and marching down into Italy to reclaim Rome. And that's actually the mythological inversion of a real story of Magnus Maximus, who is uh, a Roman officer of possible Spanish origin, who is serving in Britain in the 380s, we don't know enough about him to, to really know what his thinking was, but we know that in 383, he is proclaimed emperor. He is being ordered back to Rome to be tried on some sort of particular charges, but he, he is popular in Britain. He raises soldiers, he marches into Gaul, he captures Paris uh, in sort of the, the aftermath of that. The emperor Gratian is killed and he gets even more reinforcements, more troops, and prepares to march across the Alps into Italy. Now you might wonder, well, what the heck has that got to do really with Britain? Why is he remembered? Why does he feature so significantly in mythology? Why are we getting pillars and monuments set up in the 9th century? Uh, the king of Paris is tracing his ancestry back to Severa, daughter of Maximus, the king who killed the king of the Romans. Uh, he's remembered as Maxon, uh, Maxentius, Magentius. There's lots of different versions of his name, but it is the same person. And it may be that he, before he goes... To, to claim Rome, to, to take troops out, but he's giving some degree of authority to native leaders. He's perhaps sort of supporting them militarily. He is being remembered as a significant and great warrior. And many dynasties claim him as their progenitor, as their sort of originator. And therefore he appears in things like the Mabinogion. And of course, when Edward I is establishing his fortress at Carnarvon, we've got Sigontium, 
um, the Roman fortress just down the road, which is associated with um, the story of Magnus Maximus. But the, the fantasy castle that he builds is completely unlike other ones of the period and other ones associated with that particular king. And it's been noted before, it's been suggested that perhaps its attempt to recreate the walls uh, of Constantinople or Rome, but far more likely it's recreating in far more monumental terms the walls of the Roman city of Caerwent in southern Wales. This is, we've got late Roman walls, this sort of multi-angular structure, these nice regular blocks. We've got the sort of attempt at um, bandits walling in there. This is a, a medieval realisation or over-exaggeration of a real Roman structure. And of course, Caerwent, Ventisilurum, um, beginnings of, sort of winter, Gwent, the kingdom of Gwent. It's a significant site and quite a lot of the masonry is sadly missing. A lot of it's featuring in farmhouses in the immediate area, but it's quite possible some of it ended up in, in, Wales, but in North Wales, but certainly it's this rebuilding, the monumentalization of those Roman walls with eagles on the top that is really fulfilling the myth of Maxon. He's not coming back. He is not going to save you. This Norman, uh, this sort of Plantagenet king is creating a fortress that fulfills that myth as part of the psychological domination of North Wales. And during the building of the castle, also a body is found, uh, and it's claimed this is the body of, of Maxon, and it's been buried in the local church. Therefore, it's the, the Anglo Norman monarchy taking possession of the myth, but also the physical remains of the mythological character. A similar thing, arguably, happening at, at Chepstow, the River Wye. We've got uh, the first phase castle there, possibly in the 1080s, of a large hall. And the key thing about that hall is that well, William I, who potentially is building it, there's uh, everyone's favourite Dumbledore, uh, Michael Gambon, <laughs> playing uh, William I. <clears throat> but structurally, it, it's of the lower courses. We've got lots of squares in masonry, we've got tile courses. There is a real sense that this is using Roman masonry, but also using it in a Roman way, in a very sort of late third, fourth century, having these tile, red tile courses, reusing Roman sculpture. It's cannibalizing Roman masonry from another site. And it could be Kerwent just down the road, um, the, the, the uh, as we said, the city for the Silurius tribe originally, it could be the Forum and Basilica. There is largely the materials being taken away and reused. It could also be they're cannibalizing Kellyan just down the road from there, the legionary fortress. Um, for the second legion, Augusta, this is the site that Geoffrey of Monmouth, he is from Monmouth, we must assume from his name, it's the site that he knows. But this is Kellyan that he credits as Arthur's citadel, as Arthur's centre. He doesn't call it Camelot, that's due to later medieval writers, but it's got very good mythological association. And we know that there are large structures there which are also being cannibalised about the time that Chepstow Castle is being built. So we've got there, arguably, William <coughs> recognising Welsh myths, recognising these monumental structures, not creating something new, not quarrying new stone, but deliberately appropriating Roman masonry, reusing it, establishing uh, a Norman version of a Roman site, a Roman centre of administration, appropriating the myths for his own benefit. And, two, minutes. two minutes, thank you. And then we have sites where by legend, truthing and myth fulfilment come together. Uh, Glastonbury is a good example of that. After Tintagel, close, more closely associated with Arthur. Avalon, where Geoffrey of Monmouth said Arthur is conveyed with mortal wounds to be <laughs> healed. Excavation saying, yes, there is post-Roman activity, housing, uh, structures, pottery, imported wares. We've got an early church established by 1000 AD. There's a significant fire that wipes out the earlier building, which is rebuilt in stone in the 1180s under Henry II. And we can see with Henry II, we've got, oops, sorry, we've got this idea. In his own lifetime, Gerald of Wales tells us, Henry II was trying to locate the splendid tomb of Arthur. It's politically important to do that, especially if you're making claims over Wales, as indeed with Richard I, wonderful Sean Connery, Gerald of Wales tells us that Arthur is found. The body's hidden deep in the earth in a hollowed out oak trunk, and they carry it to the church with honour. And in the first example of forensic archaeology, an examination of the bones, the skull's large and capacious, 
a veritable prodigy of nature. Uh, we've got um, an immense gash across the skull. Apparently it was this wound which caused Arthur's death. Confirmation, if it were needed, that was Arthur. Comes from sort of the metal cross established with it, which in nice uh, sort of 13th or 14th century text says, here lies the famous King Arthur buried in the Isle of Avalon. Bodies removed, placed in the church, becomes a centre of pilgrimage, which is good for Glastonbury Abbey itself, is fantastically good for the monarchy, especially Edward I, who we've already seen, and Edward III, who creates tournaments and sort of revives the Arthur story for his own benefit. And Gerald tells us that many tales are told and legends invented about King Arthur and his mysteries. In their stupidity, the British people maintain he's alive. Now the truth is known. He is dead, he's not coming back to save anyone. The Norman, the Plantagenet monarchy, they've got him, they've buried him, he's, he's there. So in that sort of sense, over these few examples, I'd like to sort of just say that folklore is often dismissed as being ephemeral, having very little impact upon the tangible structures of society. The truth, however, is that foundation mythology provided a blueprint for power in the post-Roman period. The desire to legend truth folklore, anchoring myths to specific places, not only provided dynastic and political stability, but also created a profound architectural fiction, the consequences of which continue to affect us to this day. Thank you.